Hi, I'm Sarah Madusky. And I'm Shannon Madusky. And you're listening to Travel Fuels Life. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Travel Fuels Life, the show where we share stories, tips, and inspiration to help you live a travel lifestyle. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, and I am in the city of brotherly love. That's right, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I am up here doing a couple of interviews. I actually came up to see some friends that I made at TBEX this year at Corning, New York, and they're going to show me around the town in a little while. But before we get to that, I wanted to have a chance to do some interviews. So next week, I'll talk with Susan Dakota Ferrier. And on this week's episode, I have Sarah and Shannon Madusky of Obligatory Traveler. And in this episode, we're going to talk with them about couples travel. We're going to talk about miles and points with Shannon. We're going to talk about Sarah's Philadelphia Arts Audio Tour. And we'll also talk a little bit about the Uncruise, as they have gone to both Alaska and Panama on this unique cruising experience. So let's jump into our discussion this week. We are in a little breakfast nook at the Hampton Inn Convention Center. They gave us a little space to stretch out, and we're going to find out a little bit more about Obligatory Traveler. So let's get this conversation started by finding out where Sarah and Shannon fell in love with traveling. I think it mainly started, we mainly fell in love with traveling the first time we went to Panama. Mm. It was our first trip to another country, and we just loved it so much. And during that trip, I think we realized that traveling is really not that difficult. As soon as we came home from that trip, we wanted to plan a next trip because it was just so amazing. Very good. So uh, when you went to Panama, did you, uh, how did you plan out that trip? Uh, was that... Uh, something that just happened, you were like, oh, Panama, that's the place I've always wanted to go. Let's let's go there. Or how did you... Uh... We knew a few friends who had gone there and said how great it was, how it wasn't very touristy, how laid back it was, and everybody's very chill and relaxed, and you can kind of go and you can get culture and you can get beach and you can get mountains. So we thought, that sounds like our kind of place. Ah, yeah. So, so how long did you stay? Uh, we were there two weeks. Okay. Yeah, we did two weeks. And you and you said you uh, you rented a car while you were there. Yeah, I, I rented a car, and that was an interesting experience because I go to the uh, rental car counter, and I don't really speak that great Spanish, right? And they didn't really speak that great English, but I guess by pointing at different things on papers and whatnot, we managed to get to the end game, and we got the car, and we were good to go. Yeah. So, but. Uh, that was, I guess, that was the first challenge when we, uh, when we, when we got into Panama. Did you think that was going to be the challenge when you were going there? You were thinking, um, uh, I'm going to have to deal with road signs, or were you thinking, oh, I'm going to have to deal with no. uh, my Actually, reservation? Actually, uh, part of the uh, appeal to going to Panama is because it, it seemed like it was going to be an easy place to have your first experience abroad with, because you know, Panama, they're they're the U.S was there for a very long time so you figured there they a lot of people speak english actually i think when we were there they were using the u.s dollar as their currency so it you know there was a lot of easy transition with going to panama so no i I really wasn't expecting it to be all that difficult but i also wanted to try to use some spanish while we were there right (laughs) yeah that was that was the problem I spent so much time learning Spanish. I was so excited when we went, oh, I'm going to speak Spanish to everybody. And as soon as people saw us, they just started speaking to us in English. (laughs) So I never, there was one restaurant where the waitress was really nice and spoke to us in Spanish. And Mm -hmm. we were really excited because I think she knew, somehow she sensed 
that they worked on their Spanish before they came. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone else spoke to us in English right from the start. That's so, so funny. Yeah. Well, uh, you, you build up this this image of how a trip is going to go in mm -hmm. your mind before you go. And it's so funny that when you get home, you go, wow, that was not the image I had of this at all. Um, when I went to Quebec for the first time, I was using my high school French and I was so nervous. I'm like, I'm going to have to speak French to all these people and I don't know it well enough. And then I realized that most everybody, as soon as I'd say bonjour, they, they just go right into <laughs> English knowing my French accent was not very good. So, right. mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah, it's uh, so in terms of where you progressed after that, when, how long was it before you said, okay, let's go to another place and, and where did you end up going on your next trip? I think it was, it mainly had to do with what we could afford next. Uh, this was when we were still early in our marriage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were just kind of kids, uh, just out of college, paying off student loans and doing all those sorts of things. So it was, was it two years later that we went to Costa Rica? Well, we did Panama in 2007, and I think it was 2010 that we did Costa Rica. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was probably the next one that uh, was a substantial trip. Yeah. And you said, hey, it's right next door, so maybe it's just as, uh, as, as easy to get around? Well, you know, it's funny because I think one of the, the key things that we wanted to do while we chose Costa Rica, partly it, it was close by, it's affordable, you know, all those, all those things ticked off boxes. But, you know, I figured, well, I'd like to see a coffee plantation and I'm sure they have, I know they have coffee plantations there. So we got to do some, some interesting things that we wanted to do. Okay. So as a couple, do you feel like the things that you want to do are kind of on the same page or half the strip is you and half the trip is? Uh, it's some component of that. I mean, there's, there's certain elements of the trip that, you know, Sarah's driven to do. There's certain elements of it that I'm driven to do. And then there's certain elements that we're both driven to do. So it, it kind of works all the way around. I feel bad for Shannon for someday when we go to Taiwan or Hong Kong or Japan and he's going to have to go to the Hello Kitty Cafe. <laughs> So that's that's very high on my bucket list. Okay, that's and fine. Not I'll, very I'll high on his. <laughs> but I'm going to be a good sport. Yeah, yeah. I'll see it. I'll yeah. see the spectacle. <laughs> <laughs> Are you can Shannon? You can find something else to do, right? Uh, it, no, it's fine. I'll I'll go. I'm sure there's plenty to see. Yeah. <laughs> 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 if, if I had a wife, I'd be dragging her around to all the James Bond stuff. So it's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you, you just kind of work it out. I think no matter what we do, you learn something. Yeah. So yeah. even if it's not something you're completely into, it's still fun to learn about something different that you didn't know a lot about. Yeah. I don't know of, of all the travels we've done. I don't know that there's anything that kind of falls under the category of, well, we shouldn't have done that. That was terrible. Mm. I don't think we had any experiences that were no, cause like even, that. No, because even if something's not so great, we find a lot of humor in that. So <laughs> Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Usually makes for a fun story. Right. <laughs> Do you feel like uh, when, you're, when you're traveling it, that you just kind of have to set expectations aside and just say, okay, we're going to do this, whether it's... Yeah, well, actually, my, one, of the, one of the things that we look at when we choose a destination to go to, I guess it's, I, I kind of call it the spontaneous planning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we try to pick a place to go to that has like a menu of things for us to do, but we don't necessarily have to commit one okay. way or the other. We can go to a place and depending on what we're in the mood for that day, we'll, we'll do that. Okay. instead of something else and it, it's not like we're necessarily totally committed to do one thing versus another i think that's what that what some people miss when they hear me say that i plan out all the places i'm going to eat all the places that i'm going to go see and that they go well th i mean that just sounds very rigid and how is that enjoyable and i go well because really what i'm doing is i'm making a list so that I don't, if I wake up one morning and I want to do th these three things out of five, then I'll just do those three things out of five, but I don't have to think about them while I'm on the trip, or I don't have to have a bad eating experience because now I'm just hunting for something for two hours, trying to find a place to eat, and it ends up not being that great. So right. that's kind of the way you guys yeah, roll with it. 
do you plan your food and, and all that out as well? Or do you kind of just... Uh... It's a, yeah, I would say it's a little bit of both. For example, we went to New York City and I really like ice cream. So they have a place that makes these unicorn ice cream cones that look like unicorns. And I knew I had to go there. There was no question. Right. Like, we're going to get unicorn ice cream cones. <laughs> but sometimes it's on the fly. Thank goodness now for technology and TripAdvisor and all those sorts of sites. Because sometimes we'll just be somewhere and be done. Kind of like when we went to the... Um, But also when we were in New York City and we were just someplace and you thought, all right, well, we don't want to go all the way across town just to get a meal. So what's in this general area that seems like it looks good and has a fairly good rating? And so it's a little bit of both. Sometimes there's a place that I feel like I have to go to and sometimes it's just on the fly. I, w- I was going to say I've, I've been fascinated by the fact that I've talked to people who travel who say they'll take recommendations from people, you know, at their hotel or, you know, any somebody on the street says, oh, you need to go eat there. And uh, I did that in Denver and they sent me to a steakhouse and said, oh, everybody goes to this steakhouse. Oh, OK. And then I went and it was like. I don't know. They served me my steak on a metal tray and uh, it looked like a Waffle House kind of place, Ah. uh, you know, (laughs) and I went, well, how did this play? And then I looked online and it got it was getting four stars. And I'm thinking, how is this place getting four stars? Yeah. Now, I know when we were in Alaska, when we were in Fairbanks, we had a driver that was there. We didn't rent a car, so she drove us around to a few places, and she recommended a Thai restaurant. Mm -hmm. The first one she said to go to, we couldn't go to because we didn't have a car, and it was far from where we were. So she said, all right, well, if you can't go there, the second runner-up is this one, and we went, and it was really, really good. Mm. So I thought, I have to start asking the drivers (laughs) where (laughs) where we should eat at because they seem to be in the know. Right. (laughs) <laughs> That's the fun part about traveling, though. You you definitely get to see a uh, a, a variety of things happen during your during your travels. In terms of how you where where your strengths are, in terms of um, I like to say sometimes people are right brain, more creative. Sometimes people are more left brain. Where do you guys uh, fit fit into that? I would say that I'm definitely the creative one. Mm-hmm. I've been like that ever since I was a little kid. I was always in plays and music lessons and just everything. I love anything that has to do with creativity. I love making things. So that's always really exciting, hence the blog and the photography. So I do all the creative work. I do the blogging and writing. I do uh, the video. And then I think we kind of share pictures. We both do a little bit of the pictures because mm-hmm. Shannon will take the pictures, although I'm, I usually do the sorting and the uh, cropping and all that kind of stuff that has to go with doing pictures. Yeah. So you're not the uh, Taco Bell. Um, yeah, you haven't seen that commercial yet, I no. guess, of the, uh, the, the, the travel blogger who's uh, got it. Her boyfriend is, uh, they call it Instagram boyfriend. Yes. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's not your lot in life. No, I mean, I can, I can do some of the photography. I do do some of that mostly supplemental to whatever Sarah's doing occasionally I will torment him like when we went to uh, the Brooklyn Bridge and I really wanted a picture of me jumping on the Brooklyn Bridge because I've just seen everybody else with jumping pictures so I'm jumping up and down (laughs) on the Brooklyn Bridge and he's taking photos of me yeah (laughs) I'll do that I was going to say that went to a lot better place than I thought when you said jump and Brooklyn Bridge. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, no, not that part. Yeah. I haven't seen Jumping this. Jumping on, not yes. off. Yeah. I, I haven't seen this picture yet. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I do more of the, the, the logistics, the getting the plane tickets and hunting out places to stay and, and how are we paying for this and managing the costs and all those sorts of things. So that's, I take care of that stuff so that she can have more time to be on the more creative side. Okay. And so when you're, one of the things that I know trying to figure out how to get more travel in and, and trying to maximize your money for all of this, that you do a lot of work with, with miles and points and, and all of that. Yeah, I do my fair share of that. Um, I mean, I figure if I'm going to be spending money on whatever we're spending money on, I might as well funnel it through a program and get something back for the effort. Mm-hmm. So, and it's worked out really well. It, it's really 
uh, kept the cost of uh, trips that probably would not have happened if we didn't have some way to supplement the cost. I mean, we got to go to, to South Africa because we used points to kind of cut the cost of the airline, the airfare, which, is, which was substantial mm-hmm. for a trip like that. And we did the same thing um, when we went to Alaska. We used uh, uh, credit card points to cut the cost on, again, airfare and actually even some lodging. So, it, yeah, it, 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 uh, it's, it's really important. <laughs> so, so, so yesterday it was funny because we went out to eat and both of us threw down our Chase Sapphire Reserve card to confuse the waitress as much as we possibly could, right? <laughs> right. Um, so, and that seems to be a staple. I mean, in terms of, of travel, I guess a lot of people use uh, either the American Express Platinum as a good good direction to go or, or that. Do you, uh, how do you juggle credit cards? I've heard theories as in, you know, just get every single credit card you can get your hands on, even if they have... Uh, you know, fees that they pay for themselves over time, or do you kind of focus on just a, a set group of cards? I find it hard to justify getting every card I can possibly get because I only have so much spending power. And if you if you diffuse your spending across too many cards, you're just you're not going to be able to accumulate enough points in any one system to be able to do anything with it. So. For me, it's worked out well to use Chase's Ultimate Rewards program. So that's kind of what we've gone with. And it's, like I said, it's worked out really well. I mean, we have three different cards that we use, and we, uh, we use them in targeted ways because each one has different programs and different ways of maximizing the points on certain types of purchases. So mm-hmm. we do that. And the nice thing is, is that all those cards, all those points... They're, it, it's interconnected. So the reserve card gives you the biggest bang for your buck. They'll give you one and a half times the purchase power on your points, whereas some of the other ones only may give you one and a quarter or just one time. So when you have all these cards, if you can accumulate all the points and then transfer them over to the one that gives you the biggest bang for your buck, that's where you really make out. Okay. And you're doing uh, the other thing I found interesting is that you can sort of stack other things on top. So I use hotels.com and you said that you not only use hotels.com, but you go one step further. Yeah. So there are websites out there that, or merchants, if you will, that sell discounted gift cards. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it varies because it's, it's a supply and demand type of situation. There's people that, that get gift cards and they're like, well, what am I going to do with this? I have no use for it. So they have, so you have these these discount gift card site, they're like, well, give it to us. We'll give you some money for it. Obviously, it's going to be at a discounted rate. And then they resell them to others that, that want it, and you get discounts on the card. So, like Hotels.com. I'll get uh, – we actually just used this recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, I bought $500 worth of gift cards of Hotels.com, and it was 10% off. So, what's that? I saved 50 bucks. I mean, it's not a ton, but – Every little bit helps. Plus, you're getting your free night every every ten. So, yeah, which yeah. I we haven't used Hotels.com enough yet to get our first free night, but we're really close. I think we'll, okay. we'll probably have it next year. I'm a gold member. <laughs> Some I got this email saying you are now a gold member. I guess after you get past thirty uh, in a year, you get you get gold membership. Wow, and so that yeah, fancy. Yeah. <laughs> I still don't know exactly what I get out of it, uh, except that I have a little gold bar across when I go to Hotels.com and log in now. I feel special. (laughs) But but at least you feel like you're getting something out of, I mean, it is nice when you start planning a trip and you go, oh, I do have a free night. I can go ahead and use that somewhere. So, Yeah, it comes in handy. It definitely comes in handy. Yeah, Yeah. we're members with, uh, what is it, IHG? Yeah, so like the credit card, that, the Chase credit card that I have, mm-hmm. when I make purchases on certain items, I'll get points for the Chase credit card. But because that card is also linked to an IHG rewards account, I'll also get points on that IHG mm-hmm. rewards account for the same purchase. So it's, yeah. 
happening in two different spots. I just like that the last time we went to a hotel, they gave us chocolate because we were members. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That was, that was my perk. The, the perks. <laughs> well, I was going to say, are you guys luxury travelers or do you uh, try to travel as inexpensively as you can? Are you doing hostels or what? where does your... Where do you fit in that range? I would say we're somewhere in between. We don't really do the high-end luxury stuff. I feel like we're kind of old for hostels. Not that, I I mean, there's people who are much older who do hostels. I'm a really light sleeper. Uh, So, and he snores enough for one person. (laughs) So I can't imagine being in a room full of snorers. But um, yeah, yeah, I think we're somewhere in between. It depends, it depends on points. we had a friend who had a timeshare who let us use it a few times and the places we stayed at were beautiful and amazing and mm. probably places we wouldn't have paid for right if we had been paying for them outright yeah so if we can stay somewhere super nice we'll definitely do it but we're not going to pay a ton of money to do it have you done uh, Airbnbs and gone that route or, or stu- stuck with hotels? Uh, we did an Airbnb in Belize when we stayed there. So it was a woman and she had a bunch of little apartments. And it was fantastic. She was a artist um, and she was an expat from Italy. And her name was Luciana, which is the perfect name for that. And she was just, she was amazing. And she lived there with her, with her mom, who was Mama, who only spoke Italian and she would talk to you, not seeming to care whether or not you understood <laughs> what she was saying. She would just start talking She's to you. She's so passionate. You yeah, just want yeah. to listen. Mm-hmm. And then um, there was one point where she said she was talking about someone else and said something to Luciana. And Luciana just said, Mama. And all I kept thinking was, I wish I spoke Italian. So I knew what she had <laughs> said because it sounded very scandalous. Oh. But that was an Airbnb. And that was great. Okay. We had the best time while we were there. It just so happened that she had a book and art festival at the place that she owned. So that was a really neat experience. I love books. So, yeah. yeah. So you went to uh, South Africa and in, and I saw your pictures and you were getting pictures with penguins. How did that work out? <gasps> oh, that was amazing. Well, it all started because I was watching House Hunters International one day and there was an episode where they were buying a house in in Cape Town, South Africa. And, you know, they do B-roll for the show. So they were doing they were shooting some B-roll and it was just the two ladies in the show petting a penguin. And I thought, oh, my gosh, (laughs) my fingers couldn't Google fast enough to figure out how we could do that because we were we were already planning to go. So it's at the Two Oceans Aquarium. And they have rescue penguins that they've rescued from the ships would get the penguins and bring them aboard as pets. But then they would throw them overboard before they got into port Mm -hmm. because they would get fined otherwise. And Mm -hmm. then the penguins would get sick and wash up on the beach. So now they just have this little group of rescue penguins and you can give them money and the money that you give them goes towards penguin rescue And then you can hang out in their little penguin area. (laughs) And there was one very, very friendly penguin who jumped up on our laps. And he actually tried to escape with us when we left. He wanted to come home with us. Mm. So he was amazing. He was Hopper. He was amazing. So, yeah. So we got to just hang out and pet him and scratch his belly and do all that. I love animals so anything that's animal related i'm all about it well if if anybody hasn't seen uh your site yet or seen your uh your avatar that you use for your promotion on twitter and and all the rest it is a sloth yes yes and so where did this fascination with a sloth with an ice cream cone come from yeah well (laughs) sloths are my absolute favorite number one animal of all animals I'm always sad that you really can't own them because how great would it be to have a sloth? But I think it really just came from loving that they are very chill, Yeah. always seem happy, and are just content with whatever they're doing. Mm. And I guess that's kind of what I strive to be. Uh, so I strive to be a sloth. And you're, and you're a fan of ice cream. So you... Yes. Okay. So you do you purposefully have to plan in an ice cream stop on every trip yes that that generally tends to be there might be (laughs) one or two that we've done where that usually i try to hit at least three ice cream places per trip if not more yeah so there's been times i think where we've been places that just didn't 
have three ice cream places, but usually we try to get at least three in so that I can write about the ice cream and okay. rate it. And I'm going to give you a tough question then, maybe or maybe not, because maybe one just stands out. Where is the best ice cream you've had? Uh, I'll do two. So one would be more local in the United States, and that would be Springer's in Stone Harbor, New Jersey, mm -hmm. is my favorite. And I would say abroad so far, probably the Creamery in Cape Town, South Africa. Yeah, that's the one that first came to my mind. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yep, yeah, that's the yeah, one. The Creamery was That one really just good. stood out. It's, I, it's the yeah. best peanut butter ice cream I've ever had. Uh, so uh, what makes a good ice cream for you? I like really creamy ice cream, so I'm not as big on the really icy yeah. um, ice cream. Yeah, I like it when it's really creamy, and I think a good balance of flavor, because sometimes you just get the milk flavor, and you don't get whatever the flavor of the ice cream actually is, Yeah. but sometimes, occasionally, you can get one that's just way over the top with the flavor, so you don't really get any ice cream taste it's just whatever flavor that ice cream is so do you consider soft serve slumming it uh, <laughs> no 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 soft serve is soft serve it, yeah it, it's it, not ice cream yeah uh, okay okay we'll, we'll get it it's not it's not my go-to right. but if it, if it fits within the context like when we got the unicorn ice cream that's soft serve so that's okay. what you're getting so you're are you like me with coffee where it can be 120 degrees outside and i still have to have my coffee are you if it's freezing cold outside you're in alaska you you still having the ice cream yes okay yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. you oh, are for sure you yeah. are committed yeah i mean once you're <laughs> usually if you're in an ice cream place once you're inside you don't know as much anyway so yeah <laughs> <laughs> So you actually went on, uh, you, when you went to Panama, you went on an uncruise? The, sec the second time we went to Panama and Costa Rica, we went, we went with the uncruise uh, adventures. Okay, so, and then you went to Alaska also on yes. an uncruise. Okay, so explain to people who don't understand what an uncruise is, what, what's the difference between doing that and jumping on Carnival or Princess and doing a, a cruise that way? Uncruise is a small ship cruise company. So they only have a certain limitation of guests that are on there. I think when we did Alaska, it was about 60. Uh, no, that one had, well, not much more. I think it had a capacity for like 70. Yeah. So there. there's not a ton of people. They were very committed to adventure cruising mm -hmm. and nature and learning about stuff. So when we did Alaska, we went bushwhacking. That was amazing. One of my most fun activities of anything I think we've done. We did really? a lot of, yeah, we did a lot of kayaking and just hanging out in nature. And because the ship is small, they can go places that big ships can't go to. Oh. So we were in these secluded bays anchored with just us. We were the only people around. It was, it was amazing. So um, the activities are all pretty much everybody does the same activities or you get to sort of make a choice of the activities you do? How does that? Yeah, they have a choice. Usually every night they have a cocktail hour and then they go over what the activity choices for the next day are and then you sign up for it and then you get to be in the little groups that do that activity. So, for example, in Alaska, they had uh, snorkeling one day. But we weren't so into the snorkeling in Alaska thing. Yeah. So, yeah. So, we, I think that was the day we went bushwhacking with the bushwhack group instead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And usually there's, there's a morning activity and then there's an afternoon activity. So, explain to me how bushwhacking can be uh, pleasurable because I'm thinking about it and it just seems a lot of, like a lot of muscle work. Oh, it was like, it was like being a little kid. I just loved, it was like being a little kid. Again, when I was little, we had woods behind our house and we would just spend time roaming about and running through the woods. And it just felt the same way because there's no path. So you're just climbing over logs or climbing under a thing. Well, there, there are trails back there, but they're not made by humans. They're generally, you're following game trails. Mm. So this is where the bears are traveling when they go wherever they're going. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. So, so what parts of Alaska did you go to on the cruise? We were in, we started out in Juneau. Mm -hmm. We went to Glacier Bay, which that was, the, that was my only criteria for the cruise. I just wanted to do one that went to Glacier Bay. I really didn't care what else we did the rest <laughs> of the cruise. Yeah. So we did Glacier Bay. 
we were around the the Mangoon Islands. We spent one night in Gut Bay, which was one of my favorite parts of the cruise. Which it, is yeah, just this yeah. little inlet bay. It's very tiny. It's I mean it, we're throwing a bunch of names out here that you're probably going to have to look up right. on the map. But yeah. it was uh, I think it was off of Chickagoff Island. Okay, which probably doesn't help anybody. Right. But <laughs> <laughs> but we were we were in that south. I think they call it the southeast region uh-huh. of Alaska. So you got to hear the uh, how, when the uh, icebergs are calving. You were out there. Yes. How I mean because I was on. I did a. It was Princess or Carnival. I don't remember which one. But uh, we did the seven day from Vancouver up to uh anchorage and i mean we probably we went into glacier bay we were probably there for maybe two hours and you sat on the front of the ship and you just watched and it was at such a distance how i mean were you did you feel like you were pretty close to the action or i'm not sure i think there's actually a regulation from glacier bay because our cruise had a uh, a park ranger on the cruise all day Mm mm-hmm from Glacier Bay, who was there to answer questions. She did a couple talks during the day as we were moving from one place to the other. So I think you're regulated how close you can Uh, be. I thought the funniest thing was as a travel blogger, you want to get that perfect shot of something or video of something. So I had my video camera and I thought, I'm going to get a video of the calving because it'll be awesome. And we would wait and wait and wait and nothing would happen. So I turn off the video camera and as soon as I turned it off, it would happen. Mm. So I never really got to catch it because every single time it happened when the video camera was off. You you had the uh, pleasure of having a video camera. All I had was a regular camera. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it loses something in the translation yeah, when you just yeah. see a single picture of, you know, what looks like maybe something yeah, is falling Yeah, something's off. happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we were still at a distance enough that, yeah, it well, wasn't. What was that feeling when you first heard the, the noise of it? Because it really is kind of like thunder. Yeah, it's kind of like a build, almost a build, a building falling right. down or something. Oh, it was amazing. It was yeah. re- especially because it echoes throughout the where you're at too. Yeah. So, um, if if something stood out to you that you didn't expect from that trip, was there anything that you were just like that, that you brought back with you and say every time somebody asks you about that trip, you're like, oh man, I, you know this one particular thing. I would say probably. Part, well, part of it was that we actually did get to see Denali when we went. Ah. So we were very fortunate. The weather was great. Right. But probably maybe my most memorable was kayaking in Gut Bay, only because it was a surprise. It wasn't on the itinerary. And they got permission that day to go there. And they said, do you guys want to go? It's been a while since we've been here. And everybody really wants to see it. Right. So, <laughs> of course, everybody on the cruise said yes. And then they surprised us further by saying, okay, good. So we're going to go there. What we're going to do is we're going to drop anchor. And then after dinner, if you guys want to go kayaking and just take the kayaks around, go ahead. Kayaks are available for everybody. So we got to hop in the kayak and it was just so quiet and so peaceful. I don't think I've ever experienced anything that was so just quiet and still and peaceful as you almost felt bad putting the paddles in the water and making noise because you're kind of disrupting <laughs> the silence that was there. Yeah. I, when I went into, I, I don't know if you experienced this or not. When I went to Juneau, um, there were flocks of eagles and I had never, I mean, I've only ever seen one eagle on its own, but all we saw when we got in there were just eagles everywhere mm-hmm. and ravens. And yep. I don't, I'm not used to seeing ravens mm-hmm. either because they're much more of a West coast bird than they are. So it's, it's, it's really amazing. So when you went to uh, Alaska, did you just do the uncruise or did you also tack some time on for yourselves? We did the uncruise. The uncruise ended in Sitka. So we, we spent an extra day in Sitka cause now we have our national passport book and we like, we like quests. <laughs> so now uh. we have, so now we have a quest to get the stamps for the national park. Right. So, and Sitka is a national park. So, so we stayed there for a day. We did Fairbanks for a day, but that was mainly just a hopping off point. Cause we did the, we took the train yeah. to Denali, did Denali 
took the train from Denali to Anchorage and then spent a few days in Anchorage. A friend who I went to high school with lives in Anchorage, so mm. I wanted to meet up with her and spend some time. Right. I, when I went to Denali, they said, um, getting back to your thing about seeing the mountain, um, and the reason you can't see it is because most of the time it's just covered in clouds, but I was told when we went in that most of the time you're either going to see a wolf or you'll see Denali. One or the other will happen, but that's all you're going to get. You won't get both. So while we were riding the bus out, we saw a wolf, and I went, oh, no. that was cool seeing the wolf, <laughs> but now I know I'm not going to get to see Denali. Well, that still holds because we didn't see any wolves. Yeah, you didn't no. see any wolves. Okay. <laughs> what was funny about Denali, though, was our driver that day for the bus in Denali, was his name was Mike, and he talked like Batman. And I kid you not, he's, when he talked, he sounded like Batman. And he uh, kept stopping every so often and just telling us, take more pictures, take more pictures. You're not going to see it like this ever again. You guys don't know how lucky you are. Keep taking pictures wow. of it. So we probably have, yeah, we have tons, like 200 <laughs> tons. pictures of Denali. Did, yeah. did you have that terrifying part of that? I don't know how far in we were in on that ride, but mm -hmm. you're on a dirt road in a bus hanging on the edge of a mm -hmm. cliff. And then another bus wants to come around that yeah. same corner. You went through that? Oh, yeah. yeah. I just remember looking out the window going, I don't, I don't see the ground. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 you're pretty high up. You're right. It, and it's a, it's a skinny road Yeah. that's almost gonna, along a vertical cliff. Yeah. <laughs> With no guardrail, you're just, I nope. don't know if a guardrail would really help your bus anyway, but uh, yeah. It's yeah, it was a good piece of advice. Our, the, the bed and breakfast we were staying at, we were staying at the Denali Doom, and the person who does the bed and breakfast told us, I, f I forget which side now, he, but he said, if you want the best views, you sit on this side of the bus. If you're afraid of heights, yeah. you sit on the other <laughs> side of the bus. <laughs> nice. Yeah. That's we, I, I was on a horse one time uh, going up through uh, the Smoky Mountains, and um, nobody told me that the horses like to walk as close to the edge <gasps> as possible. And I'm on this whole ride going... Uh, <laughs> I'm not huh. comfortable being on a horse in the first place, but this horse seems to really like being on the edge of this, uh, on this cliff. So yeah, that uh, sounds terrifying. Yeah. There's not a wall between you even. <laughs> no, it's just like, and, and honestly, I'm driving some back roads in Europe when the roads get really thin. I'm like hugging the, you know, opposite right, the side. Yeah. yeah. Cause I'm like, nah, just, there's, there's, a, there's a certain comfort level and I'm not at it right now. Sorry. So, um, so what are you doing now in terms of, uh, of, of what you're doing work wise with all of this, um, traveling that you're doing? Is it, uh, uh are you, you're doing a blog? Yes. Okay. All right. And I see you on chats and you're, you're doing that. Yeah, I love, well. I love that part, but I mainly love that part because I just love talking to other travelers. Right. When you don't have a lot of travel people surrounding you in your regular everyday right. life, you sort of crave, you need someone to understand you yeah, <laughs> and yeah. what you, how your mind works every day and how you're always kind of just focused on the next trip and what you're doing. And, yeah. and I just love seeing other people's travels too. I'm always just as excited about other people and what they're mm. doing as I am on what I'm doing. So you guys are not just to sort of clarify, you're not these uh, vagabonds that are detached from home and you are out there just making money off of your travel life. You, you actually have your nine to five jobs yes. here, yeah. here yep. in the Philadelphia area. So, yeah. Yep. Okay. And so how does that work out in terms of being able to take the longer trips when you, uh, when you want to go? Well, I've been at my job forever now, so I get a pretty good amount of time off just because I've been there for a mm. long time and I commun or accumulate time as it goes on. Yeah. And I'm just fortunate to work for an employer that, uh, is very flexible mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, they have the right mindset. They're, they're concerned with me getting the work done. They don't really care how mm -hmm. and the timetable. So it gives me the flexibility to slide my schedule around. Uh, so do you work on the road at all or do you or you you just set off time as vacation time? I set off time for vacation time. Okay. But, you know, if we want to do like extended weekend trips, I can like bunch hours and other days so I can 
have off like a Friday and a Monday. Right. And get like an extended weekend, and it's not a big deal. Yeah. So, yeah, and I also negotiated a decent amount of vacation time when I came to the place I was at, too. So everything worked out to, to make it happen. So I guess, yeah, fortunate. Part, part, of, it is, <laughs> part of it is asking, right? Yes. I think a lot of people are nervous about actually asking the boss if they could shift their lifestyle and and that the company wouldn't get frustrated by that or that they might put their job in jeopardy by, you know, right. requesting something like that. Yeah, I mean, they have certain goals that they want to meet, and, you know, I, they hired me to help meet those goals, so there's, it, it's, a, it's a balance. Yeah. So as long as we're both on the same page, it's, it, it's all good. Yeah. Well, good. All right, so you're also, um, and, and it's funny because uh, I, feel, I talk sometimes like there's a video camera in, and people can see that I've shifted over and looked at, <laughs> at, at another person, um, but Sarah, in terms of... Um, uh, you've, you've actually done a program for your uh, local area, Philadelphia. You're, you're doing a, uh, a little guided tour, so I hear? Yeah, I did an audio tour with a company called Voice Map. It's an app that you can download on your phone, and then they have GPS-triggered audio tours. So mm-hmm. you can go on there and look at audio tours from all around the world. Before we went to... Cape Town, I actually downloaded a bunch and listened to them before we went. So I knew all the interesting things I might want to see when we go there. Mm -hmm. But I ended up doing one for Philadelphia. So it's called Art and Controversy in Philadelphia. They're more of a storytelling app. So they want you to tell the story of something. So I go from, um, I start at Logan Square and then I go around the art district area and tell different stories about art controversies Uh that have happened in Philadelphia. And there's a lot more than you think there would be. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So uh, we were talking last night about the Barnes Foundation. Yes. That's my favorite one. Okay. So So just a little insight. It's kind of a teaser on that. What? uh, That that was uh, a man who was quite the character, but had a big love for art and had his own private collection of some of the best pieces of art in the world. And he kept them in his mansion. And if you were a plumber and you wanted to come and see his collection, you could write a letter to him and he would allow you to come. But he was very against the sort of hoity-toity art community of Philadelphia. So anybody that was like that who wanted to come see his collection, he would deny them. They were never allowed to see these amazing pieces of art. And he wanted to keep it that way. He wrote it in his will and everything. And then he unfortunately passed away uh, in a car crash. And slowly over time, politics took over because he had a board of directors and certain people position themselves on the board of directors in a way that they sort of said, oh, the building that it's in, the mansion, it's in disrepair. And wouldn't it be great if we built a brand new fancy museum and put his collection in that? And everybody could come and see it now. And it was everything that was originally in his will explicitly against all of his wishes. Uh. So, yeah, so it's a museum. It's really nice, I've heard, but yeah. we've ha- we haven't been there. So, so how many different places do you, uh, do you hit in that area? Uh, I'm, trying, I'm trying to think. I'm not sure. There's quite, there's quite a few. It's about a, I would say it's about a half hour to 40 minute tour as okay. you walk along. So I also, I go into the Rocky statue and all, there's a lot of controversy uh. behind that. And there's still people who hate that it's in front of the art museum and some people who are still really angry that it's not at the top of the steps. I was going like to say, it cause to it was, so did it start out at the top of the steps and then move to the side or did it start out somewhere else, then move to the top of the steps, then somewhere else? It started at the top of the steps cause originally it was given as a gift to the city and some people thought how amazing, but the art museum thought, no, it's not. It's not art. It's a prop from a from a film. Okay. It, so it doesn't count as art. How is a sculpture not? Yeah, they they didn't <laughs> ca- they didn't count it as as art at all. Okay. So they so there was a lot of petitioning to have it moved, and they did. They moved it to the stadium area for a really long time, and people hated it <laughs> and demanded that it be back at the. Case they, Art museum. Because they could have said, yes, but he was a fictional yeah. athlete. He wasn't a real athlete. Yeah, so yeah. why is he in front of an of a athletic facility? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so everyone was upset. So I forget 
<laughs> when they when they did one of the sequel movies, they had moved it to the art museum at that point and made a compromise. So it's not at the top of the steps anymore. It's it's, it's on the ground and off to the side. But they built a nice little area for Rocky now. I, I have to say, I actually went over there today and, <laughs> and I didn't get a picture taken because uh, I was by by myself. Yeah. I just wanted to actually take a picture of it because I last time I was in Philadelphia, uh, I had an interesting experience uh, at the Rocky statue because I walked up as a, as a solo and this guy came up to me and he says, I'm trying to get back to New Orleans and I need to uh, make some money. So I'll take a picture of you <laughs> if you'll give me, well, I was in the midst of my living a James Bond lifestyle thing. So I had a money clip with my, with my money in it. And I, he asked for five, he said, for five bucks, I'll take your picture. So I walk over there and I'm handing him my cell phone, right? Which has everything mm -hmm. I own, everything I, you know, how I'm going to get home is all. And I'm handing it to this stranger who says he's just trying to get back to New Orleans and he's going to take this picture of me. And I wander over and he snaps the picture. And then as I, and it, it was great. He took like four or five pictures and I got to, you know, have some choice of what I was getting. So I didn't feel so bad about that. But then I reached in my pocket to pull out the, the money. And of course I had a 20 sitting on top and he goes, oh, oh I'll just take that. That's <gasps> fine. And I said, and, yeah, he, no, and he was yeah. holding my camera like, I'm oh. not giving this back to you. Yeah. Oh. I said, okay, this really wasn't yeah. what yeah. I wanted to go through. Oh. So, but, uh, but I said, look. We, we negotiated five. That's what you get. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> but today I was over there playing with a little filter on the, um, you know, they now have the like portrait mode. Yeah. So I was trying to get a picture of him sharp <laughs> with the, with it, you kind of blurred off in the distance. With the museum, the, the in, museum the in the background. Yeah. 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 I've, like, I've tried that too. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling the story here with my. <laughs> Probably one of my best days. Sometimes when I don't have a, anything to do. I just like to sit at the top of the steps and watch people people run up because mm -hmm. it's great people sing they hum they'll have the music playing off of their phones while they run <laughs> up the one girl the one day cracked me up because she's just going so slow and her boyfriend says you have to run you have to run and she's yelling <laughs> i am running but the best was an older guy who ran up and he was dressed head to toe like rocky mm. just in the complete exact outfit and it gets to the top of the steps and he's doing punches and the more people are surrounding him and excited and taking photos, the more he's showing off. It was it's like he's having the day of his life. <laughs> I have to admit, in March when I came here, I had my camera out and I was videoing uh -huh. as I was running up, just showing the stairs. Yeah, here, yeah. You're, you're now in Rocky shoes, except I'm a little slower. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not wearing sweatpants. Yeah. Right? But a little, little different. Yeah. So um, in terms of, I mean, the, I went to the Eastern uh, Penitentiary yesterday, and being able to listen to stories while you're doing a journey is really interesting. Yeah. So and, and, would you do more of that kind of thing? You think that? Uh... I would love to. It was really fun. It was a really neat learning experience. I got to learn things about Philadelphia. I never knew when I've lived here all my life. Yeah. So that was really exciting just as a learning experience. And it was a good writing experience because writing a little snippet that you then later have to go back and record mm. was definitely challenging. Yeah. So it was a new writing skill that I had. So yeah, I would love to do more audio tours. It would be really fun. So have you done the audio tour listening to your own commentary? Yeah, yeah, I had to because you had to walk it several times just to make sure that the GPS part triggers at the right spots uh, and that you gave the right walking directions because it's, it was a really odd experience to have sections where you just say, now you cross the street. Now you turn right. <laughs> so right. They, they were the less glamorous section <laughs> yeah. that you had to write and record. But yeah, so I had to take it maybe five times just mm -hmm. on my own, just to, until everything was perfect. So if somebody wanted to do, uh, listen to that, how do they download it? How is it? A yeah, you just download the voice map app okay. on, onto your phone and then look up Philadelphia. I think there's, 
the, they contacted me because they didn't have a lot of tours of Philadelphia and they were really looking to expand. So they actually contacted me and asked if I would want to do one. So, yeah, if you go on there and just look up Philadelphia, you can find my tour. And Is the free app? No. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There is a cost. Okay. Yeah. Per is it tour. like a monthly or it's, oh, it's per it's tour. It's per tour. Okay. So now there are some that are free. I highly recommend even if you never go there, they have a free one of Ian McKellen doing a tour of the theater district in London. Uh-huh. <gasps> it's, it's so good. Yeah. He may make fun of Patrick Stewart during the tour, uh-oh, uh-oh. which is amazing. Yeah. So yeah, that one's a great one. And that one's free. It can kind of give you an idea of what voice map is like. Yeah. So that if you want to go up places and do more tours. I, I'm glad that a lot more of that's going on. I went to uh, Gettysburg and Vitz, Vicksburg. The national parks are actually doing these audio CDs, which I don't know how environmentally friendly it is (laughs) to have solo cars going around stopping and waiting at these Mm. positions to listen to stories Mm -hmm. but uh, it it would be hard to walk Gettysburg so it 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 makes sense but it's it just adds so much more to have the stories going on while you're taking the trip so yeah Yeah, we always like that people sometimes complain about taking a tour like oh I don't want to go somewhere and take we went we went to like Chichen Itza Mm -hmm. but I feel like we learned so much from the tour guide that you might not have known if you just walked it on your own right. and just kind of looked at buildings and thought, oh, these buildings are cool. Look how cool that is. But we got to hear all the stories mm. about people who lived there mm-hmm. or how they played the games that went on there and different stuff. So I, I like doing tours, whether audio tours or an actual person, just to learn things. Right. Yeah. So where are you going next on your, uh, on your adventures around the world? We are going to Elbow K in the Bahamas. Okay. It's a tiny little island that's there. But the past two years, we've done really epic trips. It's been amazing. Yeah. But it's also been a little tiring. It, every trip has been go, go, go. Just go to the next thing. Let's see this thing. And let's hike and kayak. And so now we just want a trip where we sit maybe on a beach and read some books and have a drink and just yeah, keep I, it low key. I had said that the, uh, the, the biggest activity is going to be picking out which cocktail I'm going to have off the list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, that, you know, I, I, I hope I can do that someday. I just don't know what that's going to be. I just, I, it's hard, hard to downshift. So it'll be interesting to hear if it's, uh, if it's easy for you to, to relax during that week or if you'll be like, maybe we should be going somewhere. Maybe yeah. we should be going somewhere. It's but, only four days, so... Yeah. 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 But you're on an island, so it's yeah. not like you really can go somewhere. And it's a tiny island. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you could walk it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> nice. So uh, if, if people want to get in touch with you, see the stuff that you're doing and, and what's coming up, what's, what's the best way for somebody to tap into what Sarah and Shannon are doing? My website is obligatorytraveler.com. Mm-hmm. And I'm on all the social medias. I have a YouTube channel, but that was mainly to supplement what I do on the blog. Sometimes there's things you can write about, but it's easier just to show a video of it. Right. So I'm on YouTube, Obliga Traveler on Twitter, and then Sarah H. Medusky on Instagram. Okay. Yep. So you haven't gone into that whole, let me get every single social network exactly the same uh no well i had my instagram before i started the if you want to say the obligatory traveler brand right so i had it when i still had my old travel blog and i I just ended up keeping it i I ended up changing mine yeah so i just changed the nickname on it and yeah that's what i did too and that works yeah and uh it was a little hair raising actually at first because uh, in, in coming up with my name, I changed it like three times. And so as I was changing it each time, I was going, oh, I hope I'm not hitting some kind of limit yeah. here where I won't be able to do it. But uh, yeah. yeah, on Instagram, you can look it up either way. Yeah. So either by my actual name or by obligatory traveler. OK. And where did that name come from? Hmm. That's a story. OK, so <laughs> when I started when I started my original blog I started I was in a, I'm in a writers group South Jersey writers it's an amazing writers group and at the time there was a time when they encourage everybody to have a blog because it helps you to keep consistent writing practice so it started out 
as just a nicheless blog where I'd write about anything. And as sort of a joke, I called it the obligatory blog because everybody has their blog and that's ah, my obligatory okay. blog. Okay. And then as I went on, I learned that people seemed to enjoy when I wrote about traveling or restaurants or just doing a fun activity in Philadelphia. Those were the blogs everybody liked to read. Mm -hmm. And then as time went on, I realized, wait, a lot of people are reading this that aren't just my friends and family. So when I made the decision to switch over to doing a more professional website and actually having a brand and everybody already knew me for obligatory blogs. So I tried to figure out a way to push it over into a brand name. So right. I went with obligatory traveler. Okay. Yeah. Very nice. Well, it works. Yeah, it yeah. does. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Well, um, I'll post on the show notes page and uh, it's, it'll be at travelfuelslife.com. The lights are coming out. If, if everybody's heard racket, it's because we're actually in a Hampton Inn in the breakfast area and it's middle of the afternoon, but there's a little rustling going on. The bar is about to open, so we'll, we'll have to go grab some cocktails. <laughs> <I guess>. Yeah, right. <laughs> we did this all without the uh, enhancement of alcohol, so <laughs> th th yeah. there you go. I did have a donut at Baylor's before we came, uh, just to sugar up a little. <laughs> we, we went hunting cheesesteaks, but uh, didn't didn't have too much luck on, oh, on that. No. Well, everything was... Busy. Reading Terminal is just uh, Yeah, insane. it was chaotic. Oh, yeah, yeah especially with was. the Army-Navy uh, uh, thing going on this weekend, so yeah pretty crazy so well fantastic well i thank you guys for uh joining in and uh giving us a little bit of background and kind of giving us a, a feel for how some couples travel and uh i'm sure everybody has a different experience we're all different personalities so mm -hmm. uh but it's it's very interesting to see the the right brain left brain you know and and how that can kind of uh, be a benefit where I have to do all that stuff myself mm -hmm. and it's, it can be a challenge. I can't do both. Yeah. Great. Yeah. It's nice having someone else do the logistics. Yeah, absolutely. It's also nice having someone else do the writing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you don't have to be like me where I take pictures everywhere because I feel like I have to share them out because I don't have anybody with me to reminisce about mm -hmm. my trips. So, mm. you know, it's kind of like, yeah, sometimes you're, you're on the road going, oh, it'd be nice if I had, you know, somebody that was going wow with yeah. me at the yeah. same time mm -hmm. I'm going wow. So, yeah, completely different, different uh, uh, way of traveling. So, well, thank you very much and uh, good luck with everything down the road and enjoy the Bahamas. I hope it, uh, I hope you get some relaxation in there. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, it was great. Thanks. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening this week. And if you enjoyed the show, make sure to go out to your app and rate and subscribe. And next week, we're going to be talking with Susan Dakota Ferrier, and she's going to be telling us all about group travel and Gen Xers, and we'll talk a little generational travel. And I'll also have an episode coming up in a couple of weeks about your New Year's resolutions and financing those travel dreams in 2019. So until next time, I'm Drew Hanish of Travel Fuels Life. Have a great week and be safe on those holiday travels.